Thank you, Val. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. We have lots of activities coming up. Make sure you uh, take note of those in the bulletin. Uh, starting tomorrow night, we have pickleball in the activity center. So just anybody that would like to come out and play, it's at 7 o'clock. Even if you've never played before, this would be a good chance to learn. Uh, that'll be Monday night. Uh, Wednesday night, we have a regular prayer meeting. Thursday night, we have volleyball. Uh, and then this Saturday, we have a work day. And so get everything spruced up around the church uh, before we head into fall and before we have the apple butter festival. So anybody who's available to come out on Saturday, uh, we would appreciate it. There's a few sign-ups uh, that you can take note of. We we'll have Trunk or Treat, which will be Thursday, October the 31st. So anybody who can be involved in that, you could just sign up. And then also we're organizing the Christmas Bell Choir uh, again this year. And so if you're interested in being part of the Bell Choir, please sign up uh, for that as well. Uh, we have an organizer uh, for the Widow Widower Monthly Fellowship Group, and so Mrs. Orr is going to organize that for us. And so anybody who's interested in that, this is going to be just a social group that can get together and uh, uh, just to have a good time of fellowship with each other. Just see her, and uh, she's going to try and organize a time that works for everybody and uh, see what works out. So just see uh, Mrs. Orr uh, if you'd like to be involved in that group. Every worker or teacher in the Sunday school, there'll be a meeting for Sunday school after the service next Sunday, October the 6th. Also, anyone who would like to teach or would be willing to sub, please attend. <coughs> uh, that's from Linda, the Sunday school superintendent. So again, that's next Sunday, right after the church service for all the Sunday school teachers or anybody who might be interested in teaching. Thank you. Apple Butter Festival. Those announcements are for me. There's a whole sheet of apple butter stuff coming up very fast. Lupa is going to get her crew to uh, prep the apples on Tuesday, October 8th. That's when they uh, blanch them and put them through the food mill to get all the seeds out. Nobody likes seeds in their apple butter. I don't know why that is, but uh, they got to get the seeds out and all that stuff. That's going to be Tuesday. Then it will all be ready to go. The festival preparations itself, the cooking of the apple butter, that's stirring, folks. And then the packaging later that day is going to likely be done Thursday or Friday, weather dependent. We have learned, Skip has learned this, that when it's pouring and the rain is coming into the apple butter faster than he can cook the, rain, the water out of the apple butter, it doesn't work so well. So uh, the weather is dependent on that, but if you want to get some info on that, you can see Skip. That'll be likely done Thursday or Friday before the festival. Then uh, the night before the festival, we have some setup work to do. That usually is not too involved anymore. Uh, the morning setup, if you can be here and help from 7 to 9 to get signage up and all those things. During the festival, we need help. There's a group of folks who've been lately handling the table to sell uh, the apple butter as well as all the other things that need to be done during the Apple Butter Festival. Gary will have information for you if you'd like to help with the promotional things they're doing. This is the 10th anniversary festival. If you're going to be here during the festival, he would love to see you about that. And then, 3 o'clock, the festival ends, and we got a lot of cleanup to do. So we need folks to help with that. So there's a list, and those are all the opportunities to help with the setup, preparations for, or the actual uh, doing of the Apple Butter Festival. Something you can do before all that, Jamie and Mary, who are over here, are looking for businesses or individuals who would like to donate items for auction at the Apple Butter Festival Chinese Auction. And if you have either a business, know of a business, or you would like to have something that you think would be donated or possibly donated, see them for information, and they will be glad to assist you with that so that we can have a, a grand auction of stuff to support the food pantry. And uh, above all else, I suppose, pray for nice weather. Uh, we've, we've, we are owed nice weather based upon past the last couple of years' experience. Uh, so pray for nice weather for the Apple Butter Festival, which is coming up in less than two weeks, hard to believe. So anyway, those are the announcements. As we pray together, we have a list of folks to pray for in addition to this list. Uh, uh, 
Loretta's brother Joe, who's usually here of late, is today working. Uh, he is providing security in the parking lot. Apparently Donald Trump is speaking in Erie. And he's a security officer, so he is providing security and would appreciate prayer for everything to go smoothly for those who have to do that. And so we will pray for that as we turn to the Lord and pray for all these needs together. Father, we come before you this day and we ask of you to provide in so many ways. Often we think of the physical needs which are listed here and certainly there are many of those. But we also realize that sometimes in work, in employment, uh, we have specific needs, problems, uh, concerns. And we certainly bring those before you as well for Joe today and for those who are providing security. We pray for their safety and your wisdom for them and your help for them. And even as we go to jobs and work throughout this week for safety and, and strength and help in the various jobs we have to do, you're a God who provides for us each and every day. And sometimes at the end of the day when everything has gone well and smoothly, uh, we look back and we hardly realize or take opportunity to say thank you for what you've done for us. So we not only thank you for the help you've provided, but we look to you for help you give when we're at work, when we're in places that are difficult. We look around us now and we see many of our farmers who are involved in the grape harvest and pray for their safety and your help for them as they are doing the harvesting of grapes. We just pray that you would minister to their needs in this time of year in particular. Uh, we pray for needs that are uh, otherwise, uh, things in our lives that are important, some spoken, some unspoken, some the need of wisdom or guidance, direction for choices or decisions that are before us, some for the need of physical help and strength, as we mentioned. Many people listed here on this list, healing from injuries, facing surgeries, enduring physically hard times. And we pray for those who are in the midst of that, that you would help each one. We think of Yvonne, who uh, is in Buffalo in the hospital, and pray for her needs. Uh, certainly pray for the doctors have wisdom. We thank you for some improvement, and just pray that you would continue to heal and help her in this time. For Billy Newman as well, we pray for his need, and certainly pray that you would help him and strengthen him, and be with those doctors that are caring for him to have great wisdom, understanding, as they, as they make choices and decisions regarding his health. Pray that you'd be with those with long-term needs, those who are struggling with either the long-term physical uh, needs of some type of impairment or injuries, or those with the long-term need of cancer, which seems in many cases to go for a very long time. We pray for them. Pray that you'd be with the needs of our nation, the needs of our country, the needs of those who lead us. Pray that you'll be with the needs of those who protect us in the military. Pray that you would be with and provide for our missionaries as they serve around this world. And we ask that you would meet all the needs that are listed. And for a few moments, we'll take time as the music plays to pray for the needs we might have that aren't listed, but that we trust you to answer uh, in the same way that you faithfully will answer the things we prayed for together. We bring them all before you and ask them all in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning's scripture reading can be found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. If you'd like to follow along as I read, again, that's 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, 
add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from all his old sins. May God bless the reading of his word. We'll have our kids come up for our children's chat this morning. You, you guys will have to catch up later, okay? You know, uh, you're going to have to catch up later. But we get out our phone or our computer, and let's just say, what do we need to find? Anybody know the verse, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Any of you have heard that verse? Any of you know where it's found? Excellent. That's just... The, so we'll... No... So we'll type one of the words from that verse into my phone. I've typed the word begotten in, in the old King James. Hit the button, and I get all the, wor- all the verses that begotten has come up in. So that's not going to do it. So you probably have to type a second word in, but for sake of time, rather than me playing on my phone all day up here, I kind of know where it is already. I can find the verse. And there it is. It is John 3, 16. And it comes up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And there we found it, with a Bible app, one that's online, and it's that easy. However, how, how long have we had these things? Yeah, that, we could have had the easy button. We haven't had these smartphones very long, have we? So what did people do before the smartphone or before the computer? What did they do? No, they probably didn't do that because you have to read the whole thing to find where the verse is. That's where this stack of stuff comes in. A guy of a previous era named James Strong worked many, many, many years to take all the words of the Bible by hand and organize them so that if you look up a word... Without the benefit of a computer, you can find a verse. So, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Begotten. By the way, the print for us older folk is getting pretty small in this thing because there's a lot of words in the Bible. We can look up begotten. I can make the pages of this thing turn. Oh, B-E-G. Okay, I'm in the right place. I'm here. Began, begot. Beget, begin, begotten. There aren't too many uses. And there it is, part of the verse, John 3, 16. His only begotten son, who, that whosoever. And then you can find it's John 3, 16. Right there. This, this guy did this, and these two is every verse, every word. However, some people don't like to carry those around. So there's a smaller one. And this takes out like the, in, and of all those little words, it takes them out. And it's easier to find begotten. And the print's even a little nicer. You can read it. There they are, four of those. And you will never use any of them, will you? Because you will, every time you want to find where a verse is in the Bible, you'll take out your phone. (laughs) However, just to remind you, you're doing the exact same thing. By looking it up on your phone, where is that verse found? You were doing the same thing that for 100 and some odd years, people went to one of these books to do. Because sometimes we know of a verse, we just don't know where it is. Because just like me, I don't always memorize where it is, but I know a lot about the verse, and I say, where is that verse? 
And so we have to have a way to find it. And that's why we study God's Word, not just to read it through, but sometimes to find a verse we're familiar with that we can't find. And so we've always had to do that. We just do it different now than folks who used to use paper. And it's important because God's Word's important. Last week I had an old Bible here that we don't read anymore because it's falling apart. It's back in my office. These were in my office. All of this is because the Bible is important. And if you remember anything of last week and this week, it is the Bible is important. And we study it. We look it up on our phone or app, or we look it up in paper because it's important to study. There is no other book like this one. How many of you like other books? How many of you like reading other things? Guess what you'll not find? For any of those other books, you'll not find something to guide you to where something is in that book. Not like this. There's no other thing. Even an app. You know, if, if you like a, a modern book and you say, well, I, I read that in chapter, I don't remember. You can't go to the app and find where it was. Uh, they just don't make it for every other book. They make it for the Bible, though, because we want to study it. So that's important. Remember the importance of the Bible. And now, I don't have a deal for you guys. I can't give you a smartphone. But any of you adults, these have been in my closet forever. And if you don't use your smartphone and you don't use your computer and you would like one of these that's just been sitting in my closet and I fear will be sitting there for many years to come, they're more useful to you than me. Come take one. Don't fight over them. But there may not be four of you who want them, but I don't know. Uh, they're yours if you want them because they're going to do you more good uh, in, in being used by you than uh, sitting in my cupboard or closet for the next 20 years. And they've been there at least 12 because they were there when I got here. Nobody's ever asked me for one of these, so this is your chance. If you don't use a smartphone, you use a smartphone. <laughs> you just get, you're the one with the correct answer. You use an app. So if you who don't use an app, don't use a computer, free of charge, Free gift for the adults today. How about that? I'll, br I'll bring you something some week I'll give you. Don't worry. I'll bring you something. You can head back. I think we have Children's Church. Christina's at the back there waiting for you. <laughs> They're a big book. All right. I have my own Strong's Concordance in my library, and yes, I don't use it either. <laughs> I use the computer. The computer is a wonderful invention as far as... Poor Mr. Strong. If he could come along today and see what we could do with a computer after he spent years of his life creating that book, um, he'd probably kick some of us in the shin or something. I don't know what he'd do, uh, but in his time, a great man of God who felt called to do that. Two weeks ago, how many of you remember two weeks ago? I don't know. It's a long time, right? Last week we had a Gideon speaker, so we stepped aside from Second Peter. Two weeks ago we used the illustration of home renovation TV shows uh, to compare that to the verses uh, 5 through 7, that that's what God is doing in the lives of Christians. He's renovating us. Uh, he's trying to, when we come to Christ, totally change us, totally renovate us uh, into the likeness of his Son. We looked at seven things in those verses that he is working to change. And that's not the only seven things he's working to change, but it's a very nicely representative list. And I had Gary read through those verses again that we looked at a couple weeks ago. He's renovating our faith. He's renovating our knowledge, our self-control, our perseverance and patience, godliness, kindness, and love, and a lot of other things. He's trying to renovate us. And when you do a home renovation, because they really are a pain, uh, to live through a home renovation. Who has lived through a renovation of some of your home? Oh, yeah, okay. So you know what it's like. It, it, it's never fun, especially if you're doing bathrooms and kitchens. It's never fun. And in that renovation, there best be a purpose, because how many of you, if there was no purpose, would ever go through that again if there was no purpose to it? Nobody would do it if there was no purpose to it. If when you were done, your kitchen looked exactly the same as it was before you renovated it, nobody would ever renovate a kitchen. You're looking for something to be accomplished. And when I had to split the verses apart, it was because I realized that verses 8 and 9 talk about the potential accomplishments of God's renovation in our life. The, the church, on behalf of our, our parsonage that we live in, back a couple years ago, decided to renovate the kitchen. And the kitchen was falling into 
what a 40-year-old kitchen looks like, some disrepair. My wife was gluing the drawers together for the pull-out drawers. Wood glue was her favorite friend to try and keep them together, the fronts on them. The shelves, some of them were bowed, you know, they just kind of went like this. Uh, the shelves were bowing. Where the pantry uh, compartment was right beside the stove, through years of grease splashing on it, the wood was rippling, about ready to start coming off, the veneer wood on, on the side of it. The linoleum, you could get through it almost to the wood, some places where it had war, and the war places, same with the formica. And so the trustees came in to see what they could do to fix it, and after a couple of the trustees came in, their opinion was, there's no way to just fix little things. We've got to pretty much tear it all apart and redo it. Because you, once you've fixed one thing, you know how it is. The next thing just stands out. So it was a completely gut job, and everything came apart. And we would never have gone through it if at the end of the renovation it looked just like when it started. We wouldn't have done that. And it didn't. It looks very nice. It's functional. The drawers work. We moved that pantry cupboard away from the stove a little bit so that it's safely away from the stove. Some changes were made. And it looks much different. We didn't increase the size or, or even the, the basic parameters of where stuff was. Uh, but it certainly is much more functional and looks far better. And so we accomplished the goal. And a new floor was put in, a new uh, kind of a fl vinyl floor underneath, and it's all put together and is fine. Obviously, God has a goal of renovating us. If we have a goal of something as simple as renovating a kitchen, God has a goal of renovating us. The problem is, it's not a perfect illustration. When everything was in place, and the kitchen was done, we said, it's done. However, first of all, we are never fully renovated at some point in time. God is always working to continue to help us to be renovated. Uh, God is working on some of our strengths and our weaknesses together, and day by day we're being further renovated by our Lord. We're never to the point until we get to heaven that we are done. So that's one little difference between the, in this illustration. But then the other difference in the illustration is we have a choice in the renovation. I guess you have a choice in the renovation. You know, I know Skip and Marianne had a, their whole house renovated at one point. It would have been interesting for the contractor to arrive one morning and Marianne to get to the door and say, Nope, not today. You guys go away. I don't want you to renovate. Of course, she'd be thinking, well, I would have been nuts to do that. But, you know, obviously we pretty much don't have a choice. When they show up, we want them to come in and work. However, we have a much bigger choice with God. And that's what these two verses are going to look at. The first verse, verse 8, is what God wants to accomplish if we let him. And verse 9 is, if we don't let him, here's how it works out. Just because we believe the gospel doesn't mean every day of our life we're saying, God, come in and renovate me today. Work on me today. Help me to grow today. There are many days that that is not our attitude. And our attitude is, God, not today. Nope, you showed up with your crew, but not today, God. I'm in no mood for your renovations today. And let's be honest, that's us some days, isn't it? That's how we are some days. In verse 8... It says, here's what God is trying to do if we would let him. For if these things are yours, that's the things we looked at two weeks ago, all those things listed in verses 5 through 7, seven things. If these things are yours and they abound in you, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. When we let God do something in our lives, renovate our lives, change our lives, help us to grow in Christ in our daily living, he compares this, Peter does, the spirit-inspired author, to fruitfulness. Now, where do we think Peter got the idea to compare the Christian life to fruitfulness? Well, I have a good idea, and that is because of Jesus very continually using fruitfulness as an illustration that he gave. I'm going to read a few verses to you. They're not all the verses Jesus talked about fruitfulness. But in these verses, you will see time and time again that Jesus talked about fruitfulness and unfruitfulness 
as an illustration of what he's doing in life. In Luke chapter 6, 43 through 45, it says, For a good tree, these are the words of Jesus, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. Grape farmers tell you that. You've got to find bushes to get fine grapes. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. An evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. That's in Luke. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus told a parable of the sower trying to sow seed on multiple kinds of different soil. Some rocky, the seed wouldn't grow. Some little bit of surface growth uh, because the, the, the topsoil was a very thin layer, but it didn't amount to much. And then in the good soil, he sums it up this way, Mark 4.20. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. So he uses, again, fruit bearing. In Matthew 21, an infamous fig tree event, verses 19 through 21, it says, And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, Let no, gr no, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And when his disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also it, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done, an illustration on prayer. And then in John 15, I'll read just a couple verses, but the whole chapter talks about fruit and fruit bearing. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you. Unless you abide in me, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And I could read more verses. Jesus used this illustration over and over and over. Peter was there. Almost every time Jesus used this illustration. And finally, guess what? Peter remembers what Jesus said. It's a part of Peter's inner being. So Peter writes under the inspiration of the Spirit about being fruitful. Or not being fruitful, which is barren. And Peter uses the same illustration Jesus does. Now we know Paul wasn't with Jesus, but Paul uses the same illustration as well. The fruit of the Spirit is... Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So this constant New Testament theme, illustration of fruit. And Peter here touches on it again. If God is renovating our life, something good is going to come from it, is ultimately what he's saying. He's saying the renovation of your life will produce fruitfulness. There's a lot of different kinds of fruit. There's the fruit of spiritual life. There's the fruit of a prayer life. There's the fruit of love. There's the fruit of the Spirit. There's the fruit of service. All of the fruitfulness that comes from Jesus can come to us if we are allowing the Lord to do a work in our life. Through the Holy Spirit, the abundance of God's blessing can pour out of us, changing us, making us into something we never would have been without Jesus involved within us. That's the point of the renovation. That's the point of the changes. The point is to make us like Jesus, to make us like how Jesus would be if he were walking in our shoes, living our life in our place. What would Jesus do if he were here living for you? That's the question, and that's what would be answered if we're being renovated to be like him. We are fruitful like Jesus was fruitful in all the ways fruitfulness was in his life. So there is a point to what God is trying to do. And that point is also a blessing to us. Many of these areas of blessing help us. They inspire us. When we learn, going back to the verses a couple weeks ago, when we learn perseverance and patience, it allows us to be a far more interesting person when we need it. 
Have you ever been impatient? That's what, we allow that. That's, in, that's okay. Have you ever been the subject of somebody else's impatience? How much fun is that? You know, it's not so bad when we're impatient, but when others are impatient with us, then there's a problem. You know, none of us like to put up with impatient people. If you've ever worked in retail, there's a few impatient people out there. There's a couple of them. And they're hard to, to put up with sometimes. And yet, when I'm impatient, I'm entitled. No. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, does it? You know, you are exactly, when you're impatient, as the person who's impatient to you is when you're on the other side perceiving it. And God's not happy with either the impatience. That's why he's trying to teach us a different way. Same with love and kindness. I mean, when I'm unkind, I'm entitled to be unkind. But don't be unkind to me. We all sense that, don't we? We all like to be the, the, the victim of kindness, not the victim of unkindness. But, but when I'm unkind, I'm just like the person who's being unkind to me. When we are renovated, we are a blessing to others. When we are changed, we are a blessing to people. When we are different, we're the one person, perhaps, that comes to the counter today of that poor person behind the counter who treated them nicely, and perhaps they might have noticed it. And so we need to be that blessing. God is changing us to bless others. That's fruitfulness. That's what fruitfulness is. If there's one bright spot in some poor person's life tomorrow, God help us that it might be me or you. And some days it might seem to that poor person out there who's working somewhere that there's no brightness in the land except for that moment that you encountered them. And you were that moment of something different. You were that brief moment of something that was a blessing. And God wants to make us fruitful. And that's why God is renovating us, not just to benefit us, but to benefit those around us. And sometimes it's harder to see because we are so busy seeing those who don't know the Lord, who aren't being renovated, who aren't patient, who aren't loving, who aren't kind, not considerate. And there are the folks we run into, and they're a mess, and we're so burdened by the mess of those around us that we forget we are not to be like them, we are to be like our Savior. That's why he's doing a work in our lives to change us, to help us to be different than everything else that goes around in our lives around us. But, once again, do we want God to renovate us? See, this is what he's trying to do. And that's in verse 8. Do you notice a little word? Very little. It's the second word. For if... If, for if these things are yours and abound. Because the if means we have a choice. If I want God to renovate me today, if these things he's trying to do in my life today are, are, are flowering and blooming, then I'm fruitful. But if not, if not, I'm verse 9, the other side of the coin. Verse 9, for he who lacks these things... The believer who says, not today, God, I'm not going to be patient today. God, I'm not going to be loving. I'm not going to let you help me be loving today. I'm in no mood for it, God. I'm in no mood for kindness. I'm not going to do it. I'm not doing it. I'm in no mood for self-control. I really want to hit them. I'm not in a mood to be self-controlled. If we decide, forget the renovation today, forget it. What does that mean? Well, that means two things. First, we are short-sighted. The word here is the word that we get the technical phrase myopia from, which is short-sightedness. I've grown up all my life not being able to see anything out there. If I take these off, you're a bunch of blurs. You're a good-looking bunch of blurs, but you're a bunch of blurs. Oh, there you are. You're back. Okay, I see you again. You're back. I got glasses when I was in, I think, sixth grade, and I just didn't realize up until that point I couldn't see anything. Then I realized I put that first pair of glasses on, and I could not believe what the world looked like out there. And uh, 
I need them. Now I need them to read. I can't see anything anymore. But we're talking about short-sighted being able to see only a few things that are right up close and nothing out there is what this verse is talking about. We are short-sighted. You know, this is why on my driver's license it says that I must drive with corrective lenses. You don't want to get near me on any road if I'm not wearing my glasses. And I don't wear contacts, so it, it is my glasses. You don't want to get near me because I can't see. I can't drive. I cannot see to be able to do that in a safe manner. Short-sighted. So what does God say about short-sighted here? Well, he's talking about the short-sightedness of emphasizing the very near term and not worrying about what's out there. You know, I can see the front of my hood. When I'm driving without my glasses, I can see the front of the hood and a little bit beyond it. Well, that's enough, right? Only if I go five miles an hour. It's, a, it's enough, cause, but I can't see anything out there. Short-sighted doesn't cut it when it comes to driving and a lot of other things. Some people are very short-sighted. All who are unbelievers are very short-sighted. They're living for the 70, 80, 90, 100 years you get down here at the expense of the eternity that's to come that lasts for how long? Forever. And all the effort, all the, the energy, all of everything is poured into this life without thought or consideration that this life in its longest extent, a hundred years or so, is nothing in time compared to eternity. And for those of us who are Christians, sometimes we get very short-sighted, living only for this day or this time or this week or this month or this little part, part of our life, forgetting about that there's an eternity out there. In eternity, guess what counts? What counts is if you were the blessing to others, if you were patient to others, if you were loving to others, if you were kind to others, in spite of them being none of that to you. In eternity, what counts? That you show godliness when nobody around you is godly. That you show self-control when everybody else is out of control. Those things count, and God is going to reward us for those things that count. And it's short-sighted to put all of our life investment into the time and place of this world here at the expense of the eternal world. And when we get to heaven, have nothing to show for our years in Christ. Where does time go? I don't know. It goes, though. 45 years ago tomorrow, I trusted Jesus Christ as a 17-year-old. 45 years ago. I can't even imagine. Where, where did that time go? You know, Four years of Bible college, 37 years plus as a pastor. And God's still renovating me, by the way. I'm still in need of renovation. He's still working on all these things and these verses on me because I certainly don't measure up even close to Jesus. But short-sighted is to let 45 years go by and have nothing to count for Jesus. And sadly, there's some Christians who've let most of their life just escape away and have done very little renovating or allowed the Lord to do very little renovating of their lives and very little improving of their spiritual uh, walk with him and the time is just gone it's not getting back you're not going to reclaim it somewhere that time is gone that's short-sighted and short-sighted is bad but blindness is worse and in verse 9 it says if you lack these things you're at least short-sighted maybe blind this verse kind of leads us into where we're going next week, so I won't touch on that last phrase too much except to say, how many of you would like to have a blind person, totally blind, driving your car? Not that you're on the road with them, just go, let them in the car and see what they can do with it. Anybody out there for that? The only person out there for that is one who wants to get rid of their car, right? Um, or wants Frank to have more work, one or the other. Blind folk, if you don't have the vision to see, and that could happen to any of us as we get older, can't drive. You know, it's an impairment that leads us to the place of dysfunction. Spiritual blindness is dysfunctional, especially if you're a believer. Peter, who's writing this, 
learned these lessons when Jesus was with him. They come out of the gospel. I'm going to read one more set of verses. Probably you've all heard them. But I think it's at these couple set of verses, actually two set of verses, you find where Peter decided for himself that he wanted his Savior Jesus to do a work in him and renovate him, and he would not be short-sighted or blind. It started after the arrest of Jesus in Luke 22. It says, Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him, him being Jesus. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You are also of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him. That's Jesus. For he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter was putting the short-sighted nearness of that moment above all else. Well, if I admit to knowing Jesus, maybe I'm the guy they'll throw right in line behind him. I'm not going to die here. I'm not dying with him. And he took the short-sighted. He said, Lord, not today. No renovation today. Nope, none of that. Then it was in John 21. Jesus would die on the cross. He would be buried. He would be risen. And after his resurrection in John 21, the boys uh, had gone out fishing. And Jesus comes on the shore. It says, after all that happened. So when they'd eaten breakfast... And they came to shore with Jesus, having caught the fish on the one side of the boat he told them to go to. Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Peter, said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my, feed my lambs. He, Jesus, said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. From the moment of utter despair and failure, Jesus comes and says, get on your feet, Peter, and let's start doing what we need to do. Let's renovate you. Let's get you out there to feed my sheep and be fruitful. You know, sometimes we look at a passage like this and we say, I, I'm short-sighted, I'm almost blind, I've messed it up, I, things have not gone the way they should have, I've left the Lord out of my renovation project for years, what hope do I have? And from the man who God used to write this book, a guy named Peter, who did something I don't think perhaps in our belief and in our faith, maybe before we were saved, but in our belief and in our faith, we deny the Lord completely. Peter is offered a path of restoration, a path and opportunity of forgiveness. To put that aside, that failing, that denial that happened three times, you'd think between time number two and time number three, with an hour of time passing, he might have reconsidered, but he did not. And the Lord Jesus says, Peter, get out there. I'm going to renovate you. Feed and tend to my sheep. No matter where you've come from this morning, no matter how bad it's been or how good it is or how much renovation God's been allowed to have or hasn't been allowed to have, whether you're in verse 8 where you're abounding and you're fruitful or whether you're in verse 9, unfruitful and short-sighted, no matter where you come from today, the renovator knocks on the door and says, can I come in and help renovate your life today? And the renovator is Jesus Christ. And he says, if you will take me in, we will renovate together. I love the TV programs because 
it's never just the guy or owner of the place renovating. Of course, it's always the professional. I'm not a renovator. I'm not a professional. I have a hard time with carpentry because you can't convert inches and those half-inch fraction things to decimals and do carpentry. And I convert them to decimals to work with them. That's not good for carpentry. Don't ask me to cut your board and have it accurate. It might not happen. But the professional comes in. And the professional does what I can't do. In these verses, the professional is Jesus. And he comes in and he does what I can't do. He changes things the way I couldn't change them. He changes things and makes his power, his strength, his abilities, his talents, everything he brings, he renovates. And I simply get to look and say, what amazing, amazing thing Jesus has done for me. Pan's little illustration, in awe. Forget Grand Canyon, though I think it's nice. <laughs> Forget the eclipse, I thought that was interesting. Think back if you're a Christian, and you've been a Christian for a long time. Some of you may not have been, but if you've been a Christian a long time, think back and think of what God's done in your life. Think of the changes that have been made. Think of the difference, the renovation he's done. It may not be perfect. It may not be complete. It may not even be satisfactory to you or him, but think of what you've allowed him to do, and the changes he's made will put you in awe of the power of God's ability to work in your life. There's something you can be in awe about any day and every day if you've been a Christian any length of time. If you're a newer Christian, a newer believer, that probably isn't going to be the case. You better go to the Grand Canyon, I guess, because, you know, you can't look back if you only believed the Lord a month ago, maybe at those significant changes. When I look back over 45 years, I don't even recognize the person who that day came to Christ. I hardly recognize them because of the changes he's made, and it's not to be in any praise to me. He did it all. He was the professional. He came in. He changed my life. And that's what he wants to do for all of us. Father, we pray that you might help us to step forward and not say at the beginning of a day or during the day, nope, I don't want further re renovations. Nope, I don't want the Spirit of God empowering me. Nope, I'm not going to yield to the Spirit. Help us to put that aside for whatever reason it might come up and help us to look at these verses and think about the potential of what you can do, how you can come into our life, and those seven things we looked at a couple weeks ago and many others, you can plant them into us in a way that, humanly speaking, we could never plant them into us even a little bit. So we pray that we might be open to what you can do, yielded to your abilities when you knock on the door, that we open it and say, Lord, change me. As hard as it might be, change me. And we'll see the empowerment of God to do that. It might mean the words we say are different, the actions we take are different, the attitudes we have are different, but we're open to the idea and the fact that you want to change us and we want to be changed. We thank you for what you're going to do in our lives in Christ's name. Amen. Number 43, an old hymn. But it's true, great is thy faithfulness. God is a faithful renovator. You ever had the re renovation crew not show up? Oh, yeah, we'll be there Monday morning. Have you heard that line from a construction crew? Not to pick on just construction folks. And what happens Monday morning? It's dead silence. <laughs> they, they don't show up. Well, I can tell you this. God always shows up. And if you want renovation and you say, Lord, come help me, guess what? He shows up. Great is his faithfulness. We'll stand thing, sing all three verses.
Father, we pray that we might count upon your faithfulness. We're not near as faithful, nor even close to what you are. But when we need you, and when we call upon you, we can count upon you to be faithful. And so we pray that this week we will faithfully let you do a work in our life, and that even leaving here today, you will encourage us, strengthen us, forgive us where we failed, put aside our, our fa failings of the past week or more, and help us to get on track with you, our Savior. Begin again that renovation project within us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.